Good morning, Chapel. All right, all right. Two of you are awake. Let's try it one more time. Good morning, Chapel. We're uh, happy for you to be here this morning. It's always great to gather together and worship the Lord. So if you would stand as you join me in worship through. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, all can make you all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sins. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and you death has lost its thing. you be seated welcome to chapel today here at the pulpit of the Florida Baptist Convention and uh, the Baptist College of Florida we are delighted to welcome you today a few announcements spirit week is next week so uh, week 13 will be spirit week looking forward to uh, seeing you express some of that excitement also inauguration is next Tuesday at 2 o'clock we will not have chapel next Tuesday instead we'll have the inauguration in the wellness center and we will reopen the wellness center uh, next week as well so excited about that 
It is week 12. You are being asked to go ahead and register and, and sign up for your classes for next semester. That helps us to plan. It's difficult for us to plan if you don't. So don't be the last minute person. Go ahead and sign up. We have multiple, we have four new faculty members to announce uh, today we did on social media yesterday, Tim Wanamaker is joining our faculty teaching history as he prepares to finish his PhD in December. Uh, Dr. Javier Sotolongo is joining our faculty in Miami where he will be teaching there. He is one of our leading pastors in our state and pastors an incredible work there in the Miami area. And then Doug and Natalie Hankins will be joining our faculty as well. Uh, Dr. Hankins preached for us back a few months ago. He's going to be teaching in our Christian ministry area and ministry studies area. He is also the young adult pastor at the First Baptist Church of Orlando. And then Natalie, his wife, is going to be teaching English for us. And so we're going to welcome these four new faculty members on our team. And when something happens around here, I'll let you know about it. So we're excited about them. Well, we're also very excited to have Pastor Josh Revis back with us today preaching for us. He is the associate pastor of the North Jacksonville Baptist Church. You were introduced to him yesterday. He's married with three kids, has a tremendous ministry. He's been serving now at North Jacks, did you say 17 years, brother? That's incredible. And so he's one of the most sought after preachers around and just an inspiration to me. We're delighted to have him. And Caleb, thank you for leading us in worship. Our uh, band and music team is on their way back from tour and we want to remember them today. The International Mission Board had asked us to pray for the people of Nairobi, Kenya and the people of Southern Brazil. And so we will do that today. And in all of our asking, let's give thanks. God has been so good to us. Father, we do worship you today. We give you the honor and glory do your name. And we thank you for our brother who's come to preach for us today. Pour out your spirit upon this people in this place as he explains your word. Lord, may we leave here today more in love with you. We pray for refreshment and encouragement, for revival. We pray for these in Kenya, these in southern Brazil, for our team returning, Lord. Uh, keep them safe and revive this school in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all stand and join me as we continue to worship this morning? Stay. 
understand me, God. You understand me. So I throw all my cares before you. My doubts and fears don't scare you. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. So I stop. And 
Thanks again, Caleb. You've done such a fantastic job leading us this week. And thank you again, Dr. Clore, for the invitation to be here. I had a wonderful time uh, getting to tour the campus yesterday, seeing all the, uh, seeing what's happening here now and all the changes that are coming. And I'm so excited for you and for the future of the school. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 17. Yesterday uh, was the first of these two messages where we're looking at this time of preparation that Jesus is taking his disciples through before he goes to the cross. And uh, we saw yesterday that uh, we want to be marked by two things, how he begins and ends this time of preparation. The first is with humble service. And then the second, today we'll look at John chapter 17, is with passionate prayer. I think that if we can come out of these seasons and times of preparation, and if we serve like Jesus, and if we pray like Jesus, I think we'll be in a pretty good place to be able to go out into the world and to do ministry for his namesake, whether that's in vocational ministry, whether it's in uh, the secular workforce, whether it's in your home, and in your daily life. If we're serving like him and praying like him, we can be vessels that are prepared for him to use. And so uh, we're going to be looking at this idea of passionate prayer from here in John chapter 17. I, I like to refer to John chapter 17 as the Lord's Prayer. You know, often when we think of the Lord's Prayer, we think about Matthew chapter 6. But the issue with calling that prayer the Lord's Prayer is that when Jesus was teaching the disciples, there's a part of the prayer that Jesus can't pray. He says, forgive us of our sins. So it's a prayer that he gave the disciples to use as a model prayer, but Jesus never prayed that. So for me, the Lord's Prayer is here in John 17, because here is where we actually hear Jesus pray. And I don't know if you've ever uh, heard someone pray and just in hearing them pray, you knew that they walked closely with God. 
You know what I'm talking about? The the type of person that when you're talking to them about what's going on in your life and sort of at the end of the conversation, you go, well, yeah, so if you could just, you know, if if you could just pray for me. And you start to walk away and they go, okay. And they just start praying. And you go, oh. Because you kind of didn't expect them to do it right then as you're standing in the lunchroom. And I'm talking about the kind of person that when you hear them pray at a Bible study or in a gathering, you listen to them and you know, you go, this is not the first time that they've talked. And as impressive as those moments are to hear someone with that close communion with God, can you imagine what it was like to hear Jesus pray? To hear Jesus talk with the Heavenly Father? And we don't have to imagine because this is what we have here in John chapter 17. Jesus closing this time of preparation. He's served them. He's taught them. And now before they go over into the garden for another time of prayer together and preparation, he's going to pray and close their time together. And as he prays here, there's something important as we look at it. Uh, Jesus prays three things. And so we're going to look at it for the sake of our time. What I'm going to do is we're going to begin to sort of walk through the passage together. But to give you a general outline, when you look at this prayer, when you look in your Bible, you'll see that it's broken into three different paragraphs. Uh, in the original text, it's broken into three paragraphs. And each of those three paragraphs, Jesus prays for someone or some group specifically. In the first five verses, Jesus prays for himself. And in the second paragraph, from verse 6 all the way down through verse 19, Jesus prays for the disciples, for the 11 apostles that are still there in that room. And in the last paragraph, from verse 20 all the way to the end of the chapter there, in verse 26, Jesus prays for us, for the church. So we're going to look at these three parts of Jesus' prayer. And as we look at them, we're going to see how we can apply them to our lives and that we can pray like Jesus prayed. So first of all, let's see how Jesus prays for himself. Look at verse 1. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He had his eyes open when he prayed. Don't want to freak you out. Somebody, one of my kids asked me, he said, why do we close our eyes when we pray? And I gave the most spiritual answer that I could give as a pastor and a father. I don't know. (laughs) I think so. Just know that. Now, if you're just peeking to see what other people are doing, but here Jesus lifts up his eyes to the heavens and he begins to pray and he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. This is the first petition that we have here. We see it there again in verse five. You jump down there, it says, and now father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. This is the prayer that Jesus prays for himself. He says, Father, glorify me. So we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean for Jesus to be glorified? Now we use that word often, glory, the glory of God. We sing about it. We use it in the way that we talk. We talk about, oh, you know, we're praying that the glory of the Lord would come down. We pray that the Lord would be glorified. We pray that God would be glorified in this place. But the truth is, if we were all honest with ourselves, if we did something incredibly awkward and I passed a microphone around the room and asked everybody to give a definition of what the glory of God, like, what does it mean to glorify God? I think all of us would go, "Uh, uh, well, you know, like to give God glory. Well, what does that mean? Well, you know, like to glorify God, right? We sort of talk our way in circles when it comes to glory and glorification. Now, we know that certainly there is this sense of when we talk about the glory of God, it's his splendor and his majesty and his awesomeness. But to glorify God means to honor God. And when you glorify someone, you're giving them honor, but it also carries the idea of celebration, To give you a very earthly, low example of this, to glory someone, you you think about sports. There's nothing bigger in the United States than sports. And at the end of a season, when a team wins the championship, whether it's in football or baseball or basketball, that championship team will go back to their hometown. And what will they do? The town throws them a parade. People come and they gather in the streets and they parade the champions through the streets and everybody cheers and everybody celebrates the accomplishment that they've achieved because they're champions. You think about the Olympics. Someone wins a race or wins an event and they put them high on a podium. They put a medal over their neck. They play the national anthem and everybody celebrates the accomplishment that they've achieved. And so what we have is that when we honor someone, when we make much of them, it brings them glory. So in simple terms, think about it this way. To glorify God means to make a big deal of God to celebrate him, to bring him honor. 
Now, using that very simple low phrase, to make a big deal of God. Now, let's look back at that again. Look at what Jesus prays here. He says there in verse 1, Father, the hour has come, glorify. So, look, make a big deal of your Son, so that the Son may make a big deal of you. Jesus is saying, Father, make a big deal of me, so that I can make a big deal of you. And how is he going to do this? He says, because the hour has come. Why is he going to do this? Because the hour has come. So when Jesus is asking the Father to make a big deal of him, what is he asking the Father to do? He's saying, crucify me. This is how you will be glorified in me. And so we see there that this is why we make a big deal of Jesus and not ourselves. This is why we glorify Jesus and not any other religious figure. This is why we glory and make a big deal of the cross. Because look at verse 3 and 4. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. What was the work he was given to do? How did he bring glory to the Father? He went to the cross... He died for the sins of the world. He bore the wrath of God against all of sin. He finished the work. He set it from the cross. He goes and he is buried and he is raised to life three days later, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave. The cross is where Jesus made a big deal of the Father because he did what no one else could do. He accomplished what no one else could accomplish to offer what no one else can offer, which is eternal life. And so that's why we pray, Lord, we want to make a big deal of you. You know that because Jesus was lifted up in shame to die, he could bring glory to the Father through his resurrection. And so through his death and resurrection, he appeases the wrath of God, satisfies the payment of sin, and secures eternal life for all who believe. So you and I should pray what Jesus prayed. See, we tend to think this way. Father, make a big deal of me so I can make a big deal of you. Make me famous. Give me a big platform. Give me big crowds. And often we'll think it and we'll pray it with the best intentions. This is why we're obsessed with Christian celebrities. It drives me crazy. You hear some actor generically mention some sort of spirituality and you're like, oh, are they a Christian? I hope they're a Christian. If they're really a Christian, now we can reach the world. Right? If, we can, if we can just get a famous NFL player or a famous musician or a famous actor and then like really be really saved, then we can reach America with the gospel. But that's not what it's about. He doesn't need to make a big deal of us to make a big deal of him. The idea is, God, make a big deal of Jesus in me so that I may make much of you. We don't need to be a big deal. He's a big enough deal. We don't need any glory. We're not wired for it. We're not wired for celebrity. We're not wired for worship. We fail and are crushed under the load over and over and over. So what we, you can pray this every single day, what Jesus prayed for himself. And you can pray it this way. Father, make a big deal of Jesus in my life today. Father, glorify Jesus in my family today. For those of you who are married... Father, glorify Jesus in our marriage today. Make a big deal of Jesus in our church, at our college, in my friend group, on my job. Father, glorify Jesus in our nation, in our world. Father, glorify Christ. And that's something that each of us can pray every day. Again, God, make a big deal of Jesus in my life. Why? So that when people see the work that you're doing, the change that you've made, the things that are happening, and they say, how is all of this possible? Oh, there's no glory and credit. Don't make a big deal of me because it's only possible because of the Jesus who's living in me and working through me. Make a big deal of Jesus so that I can make a big deal of you. So that's what Jesus prays for himself. Second of all, we see that Jesus prays for his disciples. What does he pray for his disciples? we know he's praying two things. Uh, he's going to pray two things for them. And we know that he's praying specifically for the disciples because of what he says in verse 9. When he's praying this prayer in the second paragraph, he says, I'm praying for them and I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. He's talking about, he's saying, I'm praying for these who are in this room right now. And he prays two things for them. 
First of all, he prays. He says, Father, I want you to keep them in your name. Look at verse 11. He says, Father, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. So keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. He says, keep them in your name. If you go back to verse 6, he says about the disciples, I have manifested your name to the people who you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. They've kept your word. Now, what do they mean by this, that they've kept your word? What does Jesus mean? It means that they've stuck with him. They've stayed with him to this point. We know that one has left. Judas has left the room, if you go back to the previous chapters and see. But there are 11 still in the room. And Jesus says, Father, they've kept your word. They're with me here to the end. They've stuck with me. But did they do that in their own power? Is it because they were super Christians? Is it because they were such incredible, faithful men of God? No. Look at verse 12. He says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He's saying, while I was with them, I kept them. And while, I was, and while they're still with him, except for Judas, you know, they're still here. And here on this last night at the last meal, Jesus is praying this. He says, Father, up until this point, I've kept them. I've guarded them. I've watched over them. Now, Father, will you keep them? Will you keep them in your name? See, he knows they can't do this on their own. They can't do it in their own strength. They needed Jesus for this while he was with them. And now Jesus knows that he's going to go. So he's entrusting the care of the disciples and to his father's hands. And why do we need the father to keep us? We see it in verse 14, 15, and 16. He says, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. He literally says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Why do we need God to keep us in his name? Because we're in the world. This three verses here is where we get that common phrase that many people think is a Bible verse, that we're supposed to be in the world and not of the world. And while it's not a Bible verse in and of itself, the principle is taken from here. We are to be in the world and not of the world. We're not to separate ourselves, lock ourselves in closets and just wait for Jesus to come back. There's a mission. You can't be on mission if you stay here. You got to go. We've been sent. And he says, but they're going out into the world, but that world hates them. It opposes them. And the enemy's going to come after them. And the only way to be in the world and not of the world is to be in him. Every single day, you have to pray this for yourself. Father, keep me in your name. Keep me in your name. Why? Because you have an enemy. An enemy who hates you, who wants to destroy you, who wants to disqualify you, who wants to undermine you. It feels like we're in an epidemic of faithful leaders falling in sin and falling near the finish line. And it's devastating. And I take no joy in it. It breaks my heart. And we see young people falling away. We see older people who seem to be faithful falling away. And it's always the same culprit, sin. And that's why every single day, you can't take a day off when it comes to this. You must always be on guard. And if you're going to be out there in the world, you're going to be out there in a world that opposes you, that hates you, that wants to see you fail, that wants to undermine your ministry, that wants to undermine and disqualify your testimony, that wants to rob you of your, rob you of your influence and your impact of the world. And so every single day we must be on guard. But we don't have to be fearful because we don't have to guard ourselves. All we need to pray is what Jesus prayed. Father, keep me in your name as you kept them in your name. And how does he keep us in his name? How does he keep us clean? It's that second petition that he prays for the disciples. And you see it in verse 17. He says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Now we know that to sanctify means to make holy. And how are they going to be sanctified? By the word. See, the heart of worldliness is the rejection of God's truth. And the heart of holiness is the acceptance of God's truth. It's as simple as that. If you want to be worldly, 
push the Word of God away. If you want to be made holy, accept and bring the Word of God close. You can't be holy apart from God's Word. And one of the things I want to caution you to be careful of, this is a mistake that I made when I was in seminary. I started to think that all of my classes, I was spending all this time studying the Word of God for grades. And so I was, I was, I was learning Greek vocabulary and I was, you know, I was writing exegetical outlines of this passage over here and I was studying this book of the Bible to take a test over here. But in doing so, I began to think that that was a substitute for my personal time with the Lord. I was studying for my classes, but I wasn't letting the Word of God sanctify my heart for my daily living. And there was a distance that grew. And even though I was training to be a pastor... There was a distance growing between me and God because while I was getting all of the knowledge up here, my heart was growing cold and distant from the Lord. And so the Lord broke me. And I remember where I was and what happened. And it's another sermon for another day of my testimony, what God used to bring me to that recognition. But there became this moment that was like, if I don't have this here, it doesn't matter how much I have up here in my head. If it's not real in me, it doesn't matter what words are coming off of my lips. And if you try to live a life for the Lord apart from His Word, you are fooling yourself because it is not possible. You can't follow Jesus without your Bible. So there's got to be time every day that you're spending conversation. Listen, it's as simple as this. We speak to God in prayer. He speaks to us through His Word. This is how the conversation happens. And so I have to pray every day, first of all, what Jesus prayed for Himself Father, glorify Jesus in me. Make a big deal of Jesus in my life. Second of all, I want to pray what he prayed every day for the disciples. I want to pray every day what he prayed for the disciples. Father, keep me in your name and keep me in your word. Keep me in your name and sanctify me by your word. And then thirdly, what does he pray for the church? Did you know that Jesus prayed for you? He prayed for you specifically while he was here on earth. Look at verse 20. It says, I do not ask for these only. He's talking about the disciples in the room there. He says, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he's saying, these disciples who will be apostles once they've seen the resurrected Christ are going to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. They're going to write the gospels, write these letters, write these words that are going to go on and on for generations. You are sitting here as a product of this prayer. You are sitting here as a product of the work and ministry of those disciples all of those centuries ago. Because they were faithful to fulfill that mission. The word goes out. And then we are sitting here as fruit of that ministry. And so Jesus, you were on his mind when he was praying this prayer. Not for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And so what does he pray for us? In verse 21. That they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. He prays for them to be unified. His prayer for the church is unity. And it seems like we're living in a day where the most disunity is in the church. The world is in complete agreement about what they believe. The enemy is standing shoulder to shoulder in opposition. While we, the people of God, fist fight each other over pettiness and preferences. And what the world desperately needs is a unified people of God standing shoulder to shoulder on the truth of God's word, taking the good news of the gospel into this world that is so lost and in desperate need of salvation. But we can't do that if we're not together. We can't do that if we don't have the same heart, if we don't have the same game plan, if we're not moving in the same direction. And so his prayer, listen, this kind of unity, it's not this shallow, let's all play nice because we're on the same team kind of unity. It's a personal spiritual unity that's between believers and it's grounded in truth. And this unity is marked by a few things. We see it here in these verses. You see in verse 22 that it's marked by glory. He says, the glory that you've given me, I've given to them that they may be one as we are one. So that unity is marked by glory. We'll explain this here in a moment. Look at verse 23. He said, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them. So the unity is marked by glory. The unity is marked by love. You see there in verse 23 and in verse 24 by fellowship. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am 
to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. He says, I want them to be unified in glory. I want them to be unified in love. And I want them to be unified in fellowship. And what does that mean? It simply for the sake of time means this. It's a unity that's marked by people who make much of Jesus, love others the way that he loved them, and share life with one another. And this is what he says, the world will see this and know that we belong to him. And so I have to ask, is this what marks my life? Am am I an agent of unity or disunity amongst the people of God? The way that I interact with the people of God, does it bring glory to the Father and make much of Jesus? Does it demonstrate the love of God in the way that I treat others? Does it show in the way that I fellowship with one another? Am I bringing together or am I pushing apart and separating? See, this is the kind of unity that every believer in every church, every school, every institution should long for, pray for, and strive for. So very simply this day, I don't have a fancy closing illustration. I don't have a funny story to tell you. I don't have a heartbreaking tale of martyrdom to bring to this point to really nail this thing home. I just have this simple challenge. Get up every morning and pray what Jesus prayed. If you can make this simple prayer to mark your life, if every day you can pray this, God, make a big deal of Jesus in me so that I can make much of you. Father, keep me in your name. Keep me clean so that I may serve you faithfully. Father, keep me faithful to your word so that I can walk faithfully in your name. And Father, may people see the love of God through the way that I bring the people of God together and serve faithfully alongside with them day by day, moment by moment, in whatever ministry you give me. Make a big deal of Jesus in my life. Keep me clean. Keep me in your word. Bind our hearts together. And the Bible says that if we will do this, if this is what marks us, look at what it says there. He says, Father, I desire, and you see over and over, that the world may know that you've sent me and loved them, that you have given me because you loved me. We live this way so that the world may see in us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. So this is my challenge to you this morning. Student, faculty, adult, random stranger who wandered in the back door. I pray that this season of preparation, when you come out of it, whether you're going to be a pastor, a missionary, a teacher, whether you will do the high task of raising a family, mothering children, fathering children, as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as an employee, as a follower of Jesus, I pray that your life would be marked in such a way that people would say they served like Jesus, they prayed like Jesus, they lived like Jesus, they loved like Jesus. Father, make a big deal of Jesus in us so that we can make a big deal of you in the world. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word, I pray that we just... I pray that we wouldn't simply hear it, but that we would heed it and that, God, we would do it. And, God, I pray that if there's any area where our hearts have been pricked and pressed by the Holy Spirit, that, God, maybe our prayer has been, God, make a big deal of me. God, I pray you'd break us because God, our only desire would be that you make a big deal of Jesus. Or, God, maybe we haven't been walking faithfully according to your word so things in our lives aren't clean. God, I pray that you would convict us and that, God, we would confess our sin and that we would repent and commit ourselves to faithful obedience to your word. And God, if we haven't been an agent of unity in our friend group, in our church, in our family, in our school, God, I pray that, you would, that we would again repent and repair and restore so that, God, we can serve you faithfully. God, I pray for every student, every faculty, every person in this place. God, I pray that you would raise up, God, what you could do with just those gathered in this room, wholly committed to serve, to live, to love, and to pray like Jesus prayed. You can rock a campus. You can rattle a community. God, you can reach the world. And God, I pray you would do so for your namesake. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.